All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. And in this lesson here, we're going to be taking a look at some of the coagulopathies, the coagulation and clotting issues that we're seeing in these COVID-19 patients. I'm going to take you through and talk about what it is that we're seeing with these, some of the things to be on the lookout for, as well as some of the things that we're seeing across the country and really around the world trying to prevent and treat this issue. So make sure you guys watch all the way through to the end. There's a lot of really good information in here that you guys are going to probably be using pretty consistently when taking care of these patients. That said, real quick, if this is your first time here to the channel and you'd be interested in more critical care educational videos such as this, make sure you subscribe to the channel down below. Make sure you hit that bell icon and select all notifications so you never miss out on a new lesson. And as usual, a special shout out to our awesome Patreon subscribers. You guys have access to additional content that you can't find just on YouTube here alone. So a special thank you to all of you guys. For the rest of you guys, if you're interested in, in this additional content and showing additional support, I'm going to link to the Patreon page. But if not, don't worry, your likes and subscriptions are, are very much appreciated as well. All right, and so with that said, let's jump into our lesson here. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Eddie Watson, and this is ICU Advantage. All right, so the coagulation when we're talking about COVID-19. So one of the common things that we're seeing in patients with COVID-19 is coagulopathies. COVID-19 can lead to a form of disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, something we call DIC, and this is going to be marked by hypercoagulation. And so what we're seeing are microemboli, so clots in the microvasculature and the capillaries of the lungs, as well as macroemboli, which we're seeing larger clots in larger vessels in the lungs as well. And we had had our suspicions of these, and they were actually confirmed through different autopsies where we're really seeing these clots, both the large macroemboli as well as those microvascular microemboli on pathology. In addition to that, we're also seeing increased risk for DVTs, PEs, and even some thrombotic strokes. And so that really leads us to a question of what is actually happening in the patient with COVID-19 that's causing these issues. And the important thing to know here is that the cause is really not clear at this time, although it's probably multifactorial. So there actually are many studies and research that are currently ongoing on this topic trying to better understand it. Now the first thing going on that we think that is contributing to this is really just the severe inflammation that's taking place. And this inflammation alone is a risk factor for forming thrombi. And this can be a result of the systemic inflammation and potentially the cytokine storm, which if you want to know more about that, I'm actually going to link to a lesson right here up above that I did covering the cytokine storm. But we also have the issue from the virus itself binding to endothelial cells. The virus infecting these cells leads to an attack by the immune system, which ultimately leads to cell damage and death, which is going to lead to activation of that clotting cascade. Now, another issue that could be going on could be related to our renin-angiotensin system, or the RAS. Now, yes, this is technically a part of the RAAS system, the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, but aldosterone is not going to play a role in what we're talking about here. And so to understand this, we have to understand what's going on with the RAS. And to do that, I'm going to do a really quick overview of what's happening here. So in normal pathophysiology, if we find ourselves in a state of low blood pressure, the kidneys are going to release something called renin. Now we also have the liver, which is producing a peptide precursor, something that we call angiotensinogen. And so with the release of renin, renin is actually going to act on this angiotensinogen, and this is going to produce something that we call angiotensin 1. Now in our lungs, we have two different enzymes that are going to be important here. Angiotensin converting enzyme, or ACE, and angiotensin converting enzyme 2, or ACE2. Now we know the role of ACE2 when it comes to SARS-CoV-2, and I'm going to talk about that here in a minute, but just along our normal pathophysiological lines, what normally happens is our angiotensin 1 interacts with the ACE enzyme, and this is going to convert this into what we call angiotensin 2. Now angiotensin 2 is important because it's something that we actually refer to as a pro-inflammatory, and it does this through macrophage recruitment, which can cause tissue injury leading to clotting, as well as it can bind to receptors on cells, something that we call AT1, which can lead to immune cell activation and again, ultimately coagulation. 
Now, there's other things that happen with angiotensin 2, but these are the ones that I want to focus on because they're going to come into play here in just a minute. Now, obviously, we can end up in situations where we have too much angiotensin 2, and this is where our ACE2 receptor comes in, and it will actually take our angiotensin 2 and convert that into something that we call angiotensin 1 through 7. And angiotensin 1 through 7 is something that we refer to as an anti-inflammatory, so it counteracts the effects of angiotensin 2. And this is how the system normally kind of works and has its checks and balances. Now along comes SARS-CoV-2, which as we know binds to the ACE2 receptor. Now receptor, enzyme, they're used interchangeably here. It's the same protein that's bound in the membrane of cells. And we know that we have these ACE2 receptors in our respiratory tract, in our lungs, on the surface of endothelial cells, in the heart, as well as the kidney. But what happens in the case of SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 is that when the virus binds with this ACE2 receptor, is the virus and the receptor will actually be taken up into the cell, making that receptor no longer available. And so if you just think about that over time, as more and more of these ACE2 receptors go away, you're going to have less of an ability to convert angiotensin 2 into angiotensin 1 through 7. So you're going to end up with more angiotensin 2 and less angiotensin 1 through 7. Since we know angiotensin 2 is pro-inflammatory, we're going to have more pro-inflammatory mediators. And since the angiotensin 1 through 7 is anti-inflammatory, we're going to have less anti-inflammatory mediators. So this is going to lead to more of a process with inflammation, which ultimately can lead to damage and coagulation. And the other issue in risk factor 2 that we're seeing with these patients with especially severe COVID-19 is really just decreased mobility and moving around that ultimately can put our patients at risk for things like DVT and ultimately PE as well. So those are some of the things that we think that's going on that's leading to this coagulopathy in our COVID-19 patients. So from here, I wanted to go over real quickly some of the labs that we want to be keeping an eye on with these patients. The first of these is going to be our D-dimer. And what we notice here is that we're going to see markedly elevated levels of our D-dimer in COVID-19. And we found that people who have levels over 1,000, that this is really associated with increased mortality. Now we also want to keep an eye on our fibrinogen level. And generally, we're seeing this either elevated or normal in these patients. Although in the late stages of the disease, we might actually be seeing low levels. Thrombocytopenia is also another thing to keep an eye out for. So essentially our low platelets. Although this is going to be less common than other forms of DIC. Although some decrease is being reported. We want to keep an eye on our PTINR, which we're often finding slightly elevated. And keep an eye on your APTT, as this may be slightly reduced. Another good lab to evaluate is going to be our TAG. And this is actually going to be a really good lesson that I have planned in the future to really understand what's happening on our readings. But essentially, we want to be looking for both a decrease in our R time as well as an increase in our maximum amplitude or the MA, which we can see if we have an increased fibrinogen and platelet function. And then finally, you want to keep an eye on your factor 7 and your von Wildebrand's factor as we're also seeing elevations in these as well. So those are just some of the things to keep an eye on that can be indicative of some of these coagulopathies that we're seeing in these patients. So lastly then, let's talk about the, the different things that we can do to try and prevent and treat our patients when we find them with these clotting issues. Now the interesting thing is that we have some studies that seem to be showing a decreased mortality in severe COVID-19 patients with the use of anticoagulation. And in fact, many hospitals are therapeutically anticoagulating their patients as long as there's no real contraindications that exist in those patients. A couple suggestions or things that you may see that you may be coming across with these patients would be things like aggressive DVT prophylaxis. And really here we're talking about starting this really early, possibly even starting it in the ED. And we might want to be considering things like low molecular weight heparin or Lovenox. But in line with that aggressive treatment, we probably want to be giving this more frequently, and here we're talking BID versus daily, as well as possibly using larger doses than we normally would. We want to make sure, though, that we're checking our anti-10A levels to really see where we're at with our therapy. And as long as our platelets are above 25, we probably should be okay in using this. 
And to go along with the low molecular weight heparin, we also want to make sure that we're using compression stockings or the pneumatic sequential compression devices to try and prevent DVTs. But really kind of ultimately when we're using this alone, uh, it's found that this is frequently going to fail these patients with COVID-19. So another important thing that we want to be looking at is actually our therapeutic heparin anticoagulation. And so what we're seeing with these patients with COVID-19 is that they appear to be severely hypercoagulable, and the use of heparin seems to make sense. When considering heparin, we want to make sure that we're evaluating things like I just talked about, like our D-dimer, our TEG, as well as our fibrinogen levels. Are we seeing elevated levels of these? If so, it might be something worth considering using systemic heparin. Heparin may also help to reduce cytokine levels, which could help prevent the cytokine storm like I talked about earlier. But important to keep in mind, though, is that in late stages of this disease, uh, our patients may pose hemorrhagic risk and therefore might make the use of heparin potentially harmful. Now, since we're obviously having this hypercoagulable state in our patients, we really want to be looking out for thrombus. Now, if we find our patients with DVT or PE, obviously we want to treat them with full-dose anticoagulation and other typical strategies that we'd use, as well as we may want to consider things like TPA if we have suspicion for PE in our patient and they're in either near-code or a coding situation. Now, the last thing that I want to talk about here, just because it is something that comes up in a lot of discussion among a lot of different people all around the world, is really our ACE inhibitors. Now, remember when I just talked about the renin angiotensin system, that ACE plays a very important role in converting angiotensin to angiotensin 2, the pro-inflammatory mediator. So if we're using an ACE inhibitor, we're actually going to be preventing that conversion of angiotensin to angiotensin 2. Now, we have seen an upregulation of these ACE receptors in patients who've been taking ACE inhibitors long term. And so that really kind of led to some initial concern for an increased risk in patients with COVID-19. And some recent studies are showing that there's really no risk to patients who were on ACE inhibitors and then contracted COVID-19. But in fact, there actually was a a new Yale study that that was just recently submitted for for peer review. So we'll see what comes out of that. But there they were showing actually a decrease in the risk for hospitalization. So this might be something that potentially could show some promise. And there are actually studies that are underway looking at the potential use of ACE inhibitors as well as ARBs to treat and prevent some of the more serious complications that we see from COVID-19. All right, so those are some of the things that we're potentially doing to try and prevent or treat these patients from progressing to Uh, more serious stages of COVID-19 and to try and really limit and reduce the coagulopathies and the clotting issues that can ultimately lead to more serious outcomes and increased mortality in these patients. Hopefully this lesson overall gave you a good picture of kind of what is happening with this coagulation in these patients and that you guys have a better understanding of why that's happening, what you're looking for, and some of the things that you might be doing to try and prevent and treat that. And so with that said, that's going to end this lesson. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. If you did, please go down below, hit that like button. If you haven't subscribed already, make sure you do. And again, if you'd really be interested in supporting this channel more, head on over to the Patreon page. Make sure and keep an eye out for the next lesson that I release. Otherwise, in the meantime, make sure and check out a couple of these really awesome lessons right here. As always, I thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. You guys have a wonderful day.